Well, welcome to the, the board training. Uh, I don't know what we called this on the flyer or what your, it was like board leadership or something. It doesn't matter if you're here anyway, right? So uh, thank you for coming. Appreciate your participation in this evening's uh, uh, training. Uh, my name is Dan Clark. I am the director of the local government center at Montana State University. We're under or housed within the extension service. Uh, our mission is to work with local governments across the state, building their capacity and their effectiveness through uh, technical assistance, research, and training. So we do a lot of training all over the state. I put about 30,000 miles on a car every year. Uh, we do somewhere between 120 and 150 presentations uh, with cities and counties uh, throughout uh, Montana. And so this is one of our, I don't know if it's a semi-annual, I think sometimes the city hosts it, sometimes the county hosts it, but uh, so this is uh, one of the, one of the probably two times this year I'll be here, maybe one time, I can't, anyway. So we come often, and uh, which is good. Uh, uh, Missoula County and the city of Missoula have a lot of boards, and so it's good to be here and provide this board training. Um, I think what we'll do today is uh, hopefully everyone received a handout or a packet of handouts in the back of the room uh, to let you know we won't be going through all those handouts, but there, some of them are reference materials. Uh, and depending on the, the questions that we have, I might refer to different pages within that handout uh, or the, within the handouts. But uh, I will focus primarily on a few of those for you to, uh, to get uh, indoctrinated, if you will, about uh, the Montana Code annotated. Uh, as you'll notice, a lot of that, uh, those handouts are specific statute, statutes in the, from the law, but I want to have you become familiar with it. And so you know what the, the statutory expectation is for your role and your responsibility as a board member, as a serving on a public board. Uh, the other thing I want to point out that some of you uh, likely are uh, serving on two types of boards. You may be, to some of you, I would imagine, are serving on multiple boards some of which will prob probably uh, be an association like uh, the Chamber of Commerce. So it's, a, it's a community association or a nonprofit organization. That's a separate type of board than what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm going to talk about your service on a public board where you were likely either appointed or elected uh, to serve on that board, appointed by a government entity to do or provide a public service or uh, provide some sort of a public good. And that's the particular board that I want to focus on tonight. Some of the things that we will talk about have relevance to nonprofit boards or association boards. And that's great, but you may, on those boards you may not have the same statutory expectations, uh, i.e. noticing meetings at a certain amount of time to make sure the public is, no, uh, is aware of the conduct of the public board. That will be for your public board hat. So just think of two different hats you'll be wearing, either public or private board, but tonight we're going to be wearing, the, uh, by and large, the public board hat. Does that make sense? <laughs> I got enough nodding the heads, but the rest of you, I'm sorry, you didn't quite get that. Um, so we, we have it till 8 o'clock. I have been known to talk till 10. So some of you got to keep me focused. Uh, I'll end up telling stories, and uh, but we will take this training wherever you want it to go. As you see, I have two flip charts up here, so I do speak in flip chart stereo. It's another joke. It's going to be like this all night. If you don't like it, I can't help it. <laughs> all right, so one of the things I want you to be thinking about in the next couple of minutes is what issues or concerns that you have relative to your board service in your public board. And I want to fill up a flip chart or so here of different issues and concerns that you have that we can specifically address here tonight. You're giving up staying home with your family watching Dance with the Stars or whatever else cool thing is on tonight. To, to learn about this stuff. So I want to make sure that this is relevant and meaningful to you and, and address you whatever concerns that brought you out of your home on a dark and dreary night to be here to, to hear me. So be thinking about what is, it we, what is it that you want to make sure I cover tonight before we're done. The other thing I want to ask you is I want to get a sense of who's in the room, what kind of boards you're serving on. So I'll ask, how many of you are serving on a community council? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you are elected that position and not appointed? About half. Good. All right. Cool. Uh, how many of you are serving on a uh, water board, fire board, a special district board? So do you. Fire. What? Maybe fire. Yeah. Fire. Sewer. Where's sewer? 
There you are. Sewer. Okay, so fire, sewer. What are some other of those uh, special district boards? Weed. Weed board. Okay, we've got weeds in the room. Parks and trail. Parks and trail. What else we got? Parks. Parks. How about elections? What do you got? Something like a elections commission, elections folks? Good. Airport board? Nobody? All right. What other boards are represented in the room? Fair. Fair board? Open lands. Open lands? Cool. Animal control? Animal control? Great. Historic preservation. Historic preservation? Bike pad. Bike pad? So there's a lot. So you can see there's a lot of different boards. If you think about what's the, the role of a board, right? Why do we in, in local government have boards and what is their purpose? <coughs> now, if you were to sit back and think about all of the, the breadth of what county government, we'll just focus on county right now, the breadth of county government responsibility, right? I've been sitting in this room, this is day two, eight hours a day, yesterday, eight hours today, and there'll be another eight hours tomorrow working and talking and busy with the different divisions and, and uh, departments here in Missoula County. If, if you were a, a venture capital group that wanted to buy a county, <laughs> that's kind of anyway, just imagine, right, suspend reality, imagine if you will, buying a county. And if you were to purchase this asset and look at the scope of work that a county does from victims advocates, right, being advocates for victims of crime, to child and infant vaccinations, to noxious weed management, to uh, airport boards, right? You've got this broad breadth of different and very, uh, very unique needs and interests being represented in one. So if you're a venture capital group, you'd probably start carving off sections of this and selling it off to different entities. Right? It doesn't make sense to try to manage this all under one roof. But this is government, right? We're, we're managing it all over, under one roof. So if you want to think about what is the role and purpose of government, right? If we just got stripped it down to its very essence, this is where we as citizens, <laughs> as members of a certain geography have come together. We've decided that we want to govern ourselves. There are certain needs and issues that we face as a society that we can't manage by ourselves as individuals that there is a need for us to come together collectively to address some of these issues. What are some of those collective issues that we address together through government? Health safety and welfare, Health, safety, and welfare. public safety, fire departments, right? It makes more sense instead of each of us wanting to have all the access and resources we need to protect my own home from a fire, why don't we all pool our money together and have trained professionals with the proper equipment to protect our homes and our businesses from fire, right? So we come together, we do those things collectively that we can't do individually, right? And we've said we will tax ourselves and pool our money in order for that to happen, be effective and efficient. Now we're going to elect people to represent our interests and our needs, right? We're going to elect three, in this case, the county commission, and we've got other line officers that administer some of the work of the county, but we're going to elect these three commissioners and we're going to expect them to know and understand and be competent and capable to deal with things from victims advocate and child vaccination to airports and weeds and bike pad and all these other things that you're dealing with. Do you think that's reasonable for those three to be experts in all the, the breadth? Heavens no. Right? So we've developed this whole other structure and that's where you operate in. This structure of boards where we can be somewhat focused in each one of these, these areas and you can become the experts and you can understand all the issues relative to that particular part of this big pie that we're operating collectively. And you can feed recommendations and suggestions back up to the governing body to make final action on it. And there's a big public process. And what I want to do today is talk about that public process of how we engage the public and how do we mediate these issues and concerns that we face in our communities when we all come together and live in somewhat close proximity. Right? That's one of our roles, is to mediate these concerns and issues that, that pop up. And how do we make those good decisions and make sure that the public is involved in that? Because at the end of the day, in this democratic society that we operate in, we're representing the interests and needs of the community. Right? And so it's important that we engage them and participate in a process that engages them and helps uh, help them feel like they're informing the decision-making process. Does that make sense? All right, see you all ready. We're what is it? Ten minutes into this, we haven't even opened up the books yet. So now I've had you thinking, and I've given you a little bit of a, a 
teed you up here. What are some of the things or issues you want to make sure we cover tonight before we go home? Yes, sir. Uh, agendas, proper preparation, what should be on them? All right, so agendas, what should be on them, how to prepare them, okay, we can cover that. What else do you want to make sure we cover? Well, minutes. Minutes? What should be in them, how should they look? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, the limits of advocacy for board members. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. All right, so, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that. What else? Dissension. Dissension. In what way? Give me some more context. All right. So let's say people come in that have a very different view. Um, how do you deal with that? And maybe even I said I'm pretty helpful. So um, how do you how do you how do you deal with people who may be disruptive? Yeah. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about meeting management. Maybe we talk. We'll try to throw that in there and how do we manage and I think structurally there's ways in which you can kind of frame out a meeting to where it'll be more effective with that type of engagement. Could you put a little hyphen and um, add amongst council members to that one? Oh. Uh, so we'll, we'll do, let's do internal external amongst the governing body and then we the governing body right board or whatever engages the public how do we get along together as a board but also how does the board and collectively engage with the public good um how do you make sure that you have a <coughs> diversity of perspectives and viewpoints and skill sets on a board okay media like a Facebook live stream ties in the record policy. Uh, media, media, I don't know. And I'm trying to think of the other part of that. Uh, records. Okay. Ways in which uh, board members can participate. Yeah be in person or other hallways. So we'll put electronic, how about that? That's what it refers to it in the in the law that we can talk about the, the, the variety of ways that, that can happen. What Notification? Constitutes? Notice and what constitutes a public meeting? Okay. Good. How about one more? So we got to get out here at eight, right? <laughs> right. So did not occur that should have occurred during So sorry. So a motion. That was not voted. So kind of a parliamentary procedure. How do we deal with some of these things that come up? All right. So. All right, so party pro. All right, so I am sure things will come up as we go through. So feel free, as you can tell, this is a pretty informal style, right? Not probably what you're expecting. Sorry about that. So, uh, so please feel free, chime in, and we can take this where we need, to, uh, need it to go. Again, I want to make sure that when you leave here, you feel like you move the needle, so to speak, in your confidence and competence in your board service. So let's start, and I say this about every time, let me see if I can quickly go through principles of good governance. And usually it takes me 20 minutes, so. All right, let's see if I can do better today. Uh, in your right hand pocket, there is a packet. And if you can pull that out, we wanna look at page number one, in the right hand packet pocket, something like that. Oh, and who needs, I guess we've got some of these in the back of the room, if you need one, raise your hand, and somebody might come out and bring it up to you. Okay, so here are five principles of good governance. These are the same principles that we use as, uh, you know, we, we have as Americans this value of trying to share with the rest of the world uh, 
democracy, these principles of democratic participation, and how do we make sure governments operate within these principles. And so I, these are the same principles that we use uh, in the U.S. State Department as they work with other countries and, and other communities. And you know, we've been on a couple of projects. Uh, one was to go to Mol Moldova and work with these uh, former Soviet bloc communities or states that are trying to figure out how do we incorporate democracy within our local government, the democratic principles. And so we had a group seek us out specifically because of the types of trainings we do to teach these principles with them. We didn't get the grant, so I didn't get to go to Moldova. I had to look it up on the map where it's Moldova. Anyway, so, so these are kind of important, and I want you as we review these to think about how am I and how's my board, how's the board that I'm serving on trying to incorporate these? They're kind of a philosophical approach to the work that you do, and I often think that if you were to in really incorporate these and, and institutionalize these in your own mind, in the way you see and perceive your role as a board member serving on this board, it'll be much easier for you when an issue comes up and you think, oh gosh, how do we deal with this? We don't have a policy to provide guidance, but if you were kind of fall back on to what are these principles, and it might help guide your decision making as you go through that kind of sticky issue of trying to figure out how do we make sure that we're fair, equitable, and, and reasonable in what we do. So with that, see it's already two minutes into this and I haven't even started. Let me get my, probably messing up your microphone here. All right, so legitimacy and voice. This kind of speaks to your role as facilitators of the public process that the people that come before you have legitimacy, right? It doesn't matter what side of town, what side of the tracks or the river they live on, they have legitimacy, that they have just as much right to come to you and to share with you their concerns and their challenges and their frustrations, and that you have an expectation to listen and try to, try to take that input, figure out how does that fit in the overall operations and, and our responsibilities and how do we make sure we balance what that individual is saying to us in light of what the rest of the community's thoughts are, right? The public sometimes get frustrated because they come to their local government and they say, hey, look, I want you to do this, and they don't res they're not necessarily responsive to that initial request. And they say, look, you're working for me. It's like, yeah, and in this case, 60,000 other people like you, or the county, 116,000 other people like you. Right, we need to balance all of those inputs and those ideas and those suggestions and concerns. We've got to figure out how do we do the best for the most. Right? We can't just help you in this concern. Sometimes you can, depending on what it is. We can help address your specific issue. But sometimes you've got to think of the whole collective. Right? We're balancing those all the time. So you're always thinking about, well, yes, this is one perspective we're hearing from this one constituency that's talking to us. But whoever said over here about diversity, Right? What's the other side of the coin? What's another group going to be saying, and how do we balance those? Whether they're here or not, how do we think about all those issues, and how do we try to find the best solution for the most people? Which leads us to that consensus orientation, that we're going to work through these issues until we find some level of consensus. It's not uncommon for an issue to come up before your board. There's no... <laughs> it's easier for you to embrace the concept that government works at glacier speed. Just lean into that. Right? If you try to move things too fast and the public's not quite ca caught up with you or moving at the pace the public is ready to address or accept things, you're going to expend a tremendous amount of poli political capital. Right? You're going to burn through that political capital that you need in order for them to trust you to do the right thing. And you've got to decide how fast we want to push things. So you've really got to be thoughtful and have your you know, the, the pulse of the community is what is their willingness to accept some of these new ideas, new challenges, uh, new solutions to some of these complicated, wicked problems we face. So, so you work on these issues. It might be an idea that's presented, but you continue working on it, working on it, until you find some sort of a consensus around a solution. That doesn't mean, if you look, skip down to number three, you're, you're not kicking the can down the road, that you're also thinking about how do we be responsive to the needs and that we're effective and efficient in what we do. There's only so much efficiency you can bake into the system. Have you ever walked into a town pump or Walmart or uh, what else you got? Uh, Whole Foods or something fancy here in Missoula? You guys got all the hipster cool <laughs> things here. Town pump. Town pump is a hip, hip place. Right. Have you ever walked into a town pump and on the door pasted there is come comment 
on our annual budget? No. Why not? Why, when you walk to the courthouse, you'll see a sign that says public period on our, our county budget, but you don't see the same thing on Walmart, Town Pump, or any other businesses you go into. Why not? Because it's not our money. It's not your money, right? The relationship and the nature of your relationship with the business is different than the nature of your relationship with government. Right? So really think hard about when you hear any politician, I don't care what stripe they're from, when they say, I want to run this government more like a business. And I said, go ahead and try because you'll end up in jail. Right? Because that is antithetical. The whole purpose and, and intent of government is different than a business. Now, that's not to say we can't adopt certain business principles, and I'm all for that, because it comes back to the effectiveness and efficiency, right? But if you were to, if this county commission were just to adopt the budget without allowing you the opportunity to participate on it, in, in its forming and comment on it, even if you had absolutely no interest in it, right? I, there's not a commissioner here. City budget? How many people in the room when you adopted the city's budget? Uh, this year, 15. Last year, 125. Yeah. This year, 15. I bet maybe the year before it might have been three. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's Missoula. You might have had more people engaged. It is not uncommon. We'll have to, uh, Gallatin County passed a over $100 million budget, and they had three in the room, and, and two of them were the press, and one is the guy that comes every, every week. That budget is the most important document and the most important meeting of that governing body was that day, and no one showed up. Because that's how that local government was deciding to spend those precious resources and how they're going to allocate those resources of the community to <coughs> deliver those essential services. If you don't like the transportation system of the city of Missoula, or you don't like the transportation system of, the Gal of where am I at? Missoula County, Right? If I don't like it, I can't choose to go to their competitor. If I don't like the sewer system, I can say, well, screw them, I'm going to go with their competitor. Right? That's not an option. There is no competitor. Right? So the nature of that relationship that you have with the county or with the city is different than with the business. If I don't like time, town pump, I'll go to Conoco or Sinclair. I've got choices. It's a transactional relationship where it is not transactional with, with your local government. You can't call a different police force because I don't like those guys and I want these other guys. It's not an option. All right. This is why 20 minutes out. Strategic vision. You've got to have a strategic vision. Where are we going? Why are we engaged in this process? What is it that we hope to accomplish through our meetings? Right? Where are we headed? It's much easier for a board if they focus on some sort of an aspirational vision of, the, of, an, of a future, an image of something in the future. This is what we're working towards. Right? This is what we hope to accomplish. It will reduce the amount of conflict that is on a board when you're focused on something on the external. It, without that, we have found, just about every time, we, we're like firefighters in our office, right? We get a call, we've got a major meltdown. Within 60 mile radius, I've been to a community that's been having a spectacular meltdown. If you've read the paper, you probably know. If you don't know, I won't throw them under the bus, but it's Stevensville. <laughs> They've been having a spectacular meltdown, right? It's been in the papers, quite, quite vocal, but quite visible, right? So we're responding to that, and I don't know where I was going with this story. <laughs> Vision, right? And so th they just have this whole fighting amongst themselves. The executive branch, legislative branches are just locked in this battle over perception of power. And it just frustrates me because I can't get them off of that issue and have them start focusing about the public you serve don't really give a rip about these little nuanced discussions and fightings and battles that you're having. They just want clean water. They want good, good roads. They want a safe place to live. They, they just want you to do your job. They don't care who gets this and does that and writes that report up. That's not... Just do your job, right? So there's a little to get there. All right. Okay, number four. Accountability and transparency. I always get a kick when I get a call. It's usually twice a year I get a call from some clerk or a, a board member saying, hey, we just talked last night at our meeting, and the clerk says, the council just met last night, and they said, can we vote by secret ballot? <laughs> what do you think? I hear some giggles because that's the same thing I could... And the clerk usually says, yeah, I know, but they wanted me to call you, <laughs> right? 
why don't we vote by secret ballot on your boards? And hopefully you're not voting by secret ballot. Just to, <laughs> if that's what you're doing, take that out of your, your ground rules. But why not secret ballots? There's no accountability, right? And if you're going to be representing the public on these issues that they have, they're kind of entrusting you to weigh in and deliberate over these issues and make decisions on their behalf. And if you can't be held accountable for that, right, because you're not transparent. So it's just, it, again, it's inconsistent with democratic principles. And so, so we, we try to be open, we try to be transparent. We, we encourage you that when you're debating on these issues, you don't just bring up the issue, make the motion, no discussion and vote on it, right? But that you engage and debate over it. If nothing else, just clarify, this is the reason why. We're voting, I'm supporting this, or I'm going to vote yes on this issue for these reasons. And it might be that it's going to, you know, anyway, you might have a variety of reasons, but it's always better to articulate those because the public knows now where your head is at, why you're making that decision. If there is silence in between the motion and the action, what is it the public always is going to think? If you're not discussing that issue here in front of us, then where are you discussing it? Is it the meeting before the meeting, right? And if that's the case, then you've just violated my constitutional right. And if it's not at all, that you're not discussing at all, then I have wonder, I have question about your competence. That this is an extremely important decision and you have nothing to say about it? So either way, it doesn't make you look good. So, so engage in that process, explain and articulate to the public what it is you're doing, why you're doing it, and what your hope is. And that's what comes back to that strategic vision. You can talk about how this decision is tying into where we want to go and why that's a better place than where we are today and why we're either asking you to sacrifice and pay more or give in or, or something different, right? They need to know what is the reason why I'm being asked as a citizen by my government to do something different than what I'm already doing. Pay more, take a detour, right? Not play in the park for a while until we rebuild it, whatever it might be. And then finally, equity and rule of law. That we treat people equitably. And I want you to think about and deliberate in your mind when there's nothing else to think about. Is there a difference and what is the difference between equality and fairness? And are there times when you're going to make decisions that are fair and not equitable? And are you going to make decisions that are equitable and not fair? I used to be a mayor of a small town in Montana, and we are doing a special improvement district. It's for streets, or it's for sidewalks, cur or sidewalks, and trees and leaf pickup. Right, so leaves fall down, makes a big mess. Public's pushing on us to do something about it, so we say, all right, it's an uncompensated service that we can't afford to do anymore. So we're going to have to do a special improvement district. That's you're going to have to pay for this service that we're going to deliver for you. And we incorporated the entire city within the city boundaries. And there was people that lived off the edge of town that didn't have trees, didn't have sidewalks. And they were frustrated because if that's not fair. Why should I pay into something that I don't have either a trees or sidewalks? Right? And my response was, you're right. It's not fair. And they blew it. <laughs> right? Because they're hoping to engage in a debate. Because if I wanted to go down that path, I was going to lose. Because, yeah, you're right. It's not fair. It is equitable. We're treating you the same as everyone else in this town. That we have come together as a community and said these things are important to us. Our trees and our urban forests are essential to our survival. We live on the windy plains. And if we don't make a public investment on these trees to act as a wind block for our community, our property values go down, the cost of heating our homes goes up, aesthetics, there's all sorts of reasons why we collectively want to invest in this part of our infrastructure, right? And it's not fair that you're paying for something you're not going to get an immediate result or benefit from other than a collective general benefit that we all are going to experience, right? And so you're able to articulate that to the public. Be thoughtful about how you're representing what you're doing so that they understand and they say, gosh, I don't necessarily like it, but I get it. I understand it. And if I can get into that point, I've won, <laughs> right? Because you're not going to make them happy. I want them to understand. I want to appreciate what we're doing and why we're doing it. And as long as they can understand it, we can debate whether it's the right thing or not. But it's always easier for me to articulate back to our vision. Our vision 
these trees that we have in the community now that are all dying and falling apart were planted by someone a hundred years ago. They had a vision for our community. And what are we going to do for the vision for the next hundred years, right? That's easy for the community to grasp onto and recognize that someone sacrificed the past for me today, so maybe it's my turn now to sacrifice for the, the next generation. So it's easier to frame out those kind of conversations, help people understand the context of how they uh, fit within the general governance of their community. All right, so what was that, 15 minutes? Question, yes sir. Question on accountability. Yeah. As far as voting on motions and that sort of thing, is there a reason for, can you use electronic means such as telephones or emails to pass motions? Okay. I want to get into that, but I need to give a lot more context before we get there. Can we put a pin in it and just make sure I don't skip over it? <laughs> All right, because there's a, there's a, that, that's a great question, and particularly I, I appreciate the fact you brought up the, the phone, the Skype, and you mentioned email, text, and I want to have you think through those various uh, op options for you to vote or participate as a board. And we're going to review the law, and then I want to come back to that question and have you then deliberate on, now that we understand what the law says, which of those different options do we have that would work, that would fit within the framework of the law. Does that make sense? So a little bit of a yeah, teaching moment here. All right. Uh, did we toss anything out the list yet? No? <laughs> yeah. It's going to go like that all night. Half hour in. All right, I'm yelling at you all night, so I have to keep voice, voice. All right, let's let's do this. We talked about noticing up here, right? Notice is on there. Oh, it's without an e. Notic. Uh, let's this. make some of you that are really uncomfortable with that not being really finished. Uh, what was the most significant and interesting thing that happened in the state of Montana in 1972? Okay, we adopted a constitution, right? So that we had a constitutional convention. So where was the seat of power in Montana prior to 1972? In the decades leading up to that period, where was the seat of power? Butte. Thank you. Butte, right? A lot of decisions, a lot of power, a lot of influence emanated out of Butte. And I think there was a general frustration within the state as we became more complicated, more diverse, our economy shifting, right? And people are driving from Plentywood, Montana, across the prairie to come to the legislature to comment or participate in the legislative process. They realize, ah, the decision's clearly already been made. It doesn't matter what I say here, the fix is in. And I think that kind of added to this desire within the state for us to say, you know what, we need to control out the lead and rethink our Constitution that had previously been written, I believe, in 1889. Who was it that wrote the Constitution in 1889? Certainly wasn't the citizens, right? Just powerful people that had very specific interests, and they wrote that Constitution in their favor. And so it was the citizens of Montana who said, it's time for us to relook at this, re-examine where we're at. All right, a little history lesson there, according to me. Right? I don't know if you read that in the book, but that's my impression. All right, so once the Constitution has been adopted, uh, it's been ratified, we've all voted for it, all the lawsuits are finished, what happens to it next? We have this wonderful, if you think about a Constitution, it's like a big old mission statement and a value statement for, this, for the state. This is the role of government in our lives in the state of Montana. This is its powers, its, its uh, purpose, uh, the, its framework, offices, this is what a county's function is. This is what a municipal function is and the powers that we're going to give them. So it's really this kind of big, high-level explanation of government in the state of Montana. Then who gets it next? Legislators. Thank you. The legislature gets it, right? And what do they do with it? Statute. Look at it. <laughs> they start making laws, right? They say that we have certain rights, right? Enumerated rights in our Constitution. And they're a single sentence long. Now what the, the, the legislature does is they say, okay, now that's a right that we have. It's a simple sentence. We've got to figure out how to operationalize that. How do we create a framework to where you as government knows where's the boundaries? 
if I'm going to operate consistent with the rights that the public has to be noticed and participate and comment and all that, where are the boundaries? I need to know when I'm within the law and when I'm outside the law. And the public needs to know what are my expectations of the government? When are they operating consistent with the law and when they are they not? So that's the role of legislatures to figure out where is the lane, right? This is where the government's supposed to, and it's, it's we, the brighter the line, the better, right? And we're going to read in a minute. No, oh, they didn't make bright lines at all. It was just fuzzy. Mm -hmm. But we'll talk about that. So the legislature creates statute that helps us understand what the Constitution means. Then it comes down to the local level where they... Uh, Fortunately, at this point, the legislature has not seen fit to uh, micromanage you at the local level. They basically say, here's the big picture, and these are the certain powers and authorities we're granting to you. You need to figure out how to take those general powers and authorities and operationalize it in your local community. Does that make sense? So, it, so each community, what's going on here in Missoula and Missoula County and Missoula City is different than what's going on in Bozeman and Gallatin County or Helena and, and Lewis and Clark County, right? They all have the ability to take those same powers and authorities and interpret them with, in a way that works for them, okay? They're still within that framework, but they have a lot of flexibility within that. And that's where you sit down and say, we're going to create local policies that define how we, in this jurisdiction, roll so that the public we're engaging knows what the rules of engagement are. Okay, so you're going to create these local policies. Now, if you look in your packet on the right or left-hand side, Let's just go through that. <clears throat> Turn the page, I believe, one, L1. Now, to let you see kind of what I'm talking about, at the top of that page, there are three, it says section 8, 9, and 10, right to participate, right to know, right to privacy. Those are three sentences found in, the, in Article 2 of our Constitution. That's our Bill of Rights. And it's a single sentence that gives you, as citizens, the right to participate. The public has a right to expect governmental agencies to afford such reasonable opportunity for citizen participation in the operation of the agencies prior to final decision as may be provided by law. Boom. As may be provided by law. Legislature, here's Kirk up and said, we better create some laws that the, make sure that the public has a right to participate prior to final action. Right to know. No person shall be deprived of the right to examine documents or to observe the deliberations of all public bodies or agencies of the state government or its subdivision. Except in the case in which the demand of individual privacy clearly exceeds the merits of public disclosure. The last one is the right of pri an individual privacy is essential to the well-being of a free society and shall not be infringed without the showing of compelling state interest. Now isn't that interesting? They have set up a situation where you have a right to know, a right to observe, and a right to look at documents but also as a citizen, as an individual, you have a right to privacy, a constitutional expectation of privacy. Do you think at times within the operation of government that those two constitutional rights are going to come in direct conflict? That there will be a time where the, the state is in either possession of records, of personal records, or are talking about someone in a way that's revealing or discussing an issue of privacy? Right? where an individual will have an ex a constitutional expectation of privacy, this should not be out and known publicly. But yet you have a right to know what's going on. So direct conflict. Right? So the question comes down to whose rights are we going to violate? Are we going to violate the public's right to know or are we going to violate this individual's right to privacy? That's a pretty serious decision that your board is going to have to make whose right do we violate? Because if you get it wrong, it can be very costly. Right? So we don't want to get it wrong. So I'm just going to make you stew over that for a minute and be really anxious, like, oh my goodness, I don't want to get it wrong. So let that mm -hmm. percolate for a minute. All right. <laughs> Feeling nervous already. It's like, why am I signed up for this? This is not what I wanted. Now, this part here, local policies. If you drop down into 23103, at the bottom of page one there, public participation governed to ensure guidelines adopted. This is kind of a generic statute that is uh, for all government, all levels of government. Uh, and there's some more specificity in the law when, it's, when you get into Title VII, which is the, the title that deals with local government. So we're not going to get in there so much because we're going to start here at the big picture. 
says each agency, and if you look above, there's a definition for agency. I think all of you would, uh, and if you don't feel comfortable here, there's another spot that it's even more clear. Each of you would be considered an agency in this case, if you're serving on a board or a commissioner or a counselor or something. Each agency shall develop procedures for permitting and encouraging. If you've got a pen, I encourage you, I want you to underline that word encouraging. Because really what the law is saying here, that you have a statutory expectation to not only permit the public. Well, let me finish the sentence. Each agency shall develop procedures for permitting and encouraging the public to participate in the agency's decision that are of significant interest to the public. To permit and encourage participation prior to making, taking action. Permit to me means we're going to tell you when and where we're meeting, we're going to unlock the door. All right? But that other word, encouraging, that there is an expectation in the law for you as a board to encourage participation. Not just saying, well, I posted the meeting notice on the firehouse door <laughs> out in the woods, right? And if they really cared, they'd, they'd drive it out to the fire hall and they'd look and see what the meeting no notice is, right? So, so think about what are we doing beyond just checking the box and saying, yeah, we put the notice on the board where we said we would, but also think, what are you doing to encourage that? Which leads us to some of these social media and some other things, right? How, maybe we have a website. Maybe we have put it out on Facebook or something that we're having a meeting. Great. But then it comes back to this question, how do we manage those records? All right. Now, is there some ambiguous language that the legislature is using here? Significant interest to the public? That seems fairly subjective, doesn't it? The procedures must ensure adequate notice and assist, ooh, underline that again, assist the public participation before final agency action is taken of significant interest to the public. So not only are you to encourage, but you're also to assist the public to engage. Right, so two references in just two sentences that there's greater than just notice the meeting. Now they're using this word adequate notice, that, those two words adequate notice. Does anyone here want to define for me what adequate notice is? Okay, 48 hours, do I have 49, 50, <laughs> right? So right the way, you're right, right? We'll come back to this, you're right. When you just read that in the law, adequate notice is insufficient because what might be adequate to you may not be adequate for you, right? You tweet it out, not all I need is four hours. You, it's like, uh, I need to see a postcard, I need two weeks notice, I gotta put on my schedule, right? That's adequate for you where a tweet is all the more I need in four hours, right? So it's very subjective. And in this case, you say, well, who do I ask to get a definition of what adequate means? Because I don't know, I don't want to violate someone's constitutional right by not having the two weeks notice that he expects if I'm only going to make the notice sufficient for you. So you say, well, I'll talk to the city attorney or the county attorney. And what are they going to say? Oh. <laughs> I'll call some of my attorney friends. They call, you call half a dozen attorney friends, and what are they going to say? Oh. <laughs> so in this case, we don't know what adequate notice means to the point where I don't want to violate anyone's constitutional right. I don't know where to step. Am I in the box, out of the box? So who do you appeal to then? If your city or county attorney doesn't know, who would they ask? I guess is a better question. You could ask the public what adequate notice comes to. You could, but how many different answers are you going to get? Right? So that way you can crowdsource it and then try to take the middle. <laughs> that could be an option. So, but, but what, what happened is we'll ask the Montana Attorney General. Montana Attorney General will say, hey, we don't know what it means when the legislature said out of notice. Could you please give us a, an interpretation, a legal interpretation of what that might mean? And that's where the Attorney General's opinion came out saying, Adequate notice will be defined as 48 hours. Doesn't mean 48 business hours, you just said 48 hours. So when you're adopting your policies, that's where you sit down and say, well, how is it that we roll? Are we going to just allow 48 hours straight? Are we going to say 48 hours not including weekends? 48 business, you know, you can define that. It can't be any less than 48, but you can decide. We have some jurisdictions that said 72 hours is how we roll. 
That's how we, right, with our community, we think that's adequate notice. I know we can go to 48, but we're going to stick it at 72. We can do that. It's entirely up to you. Can't be anything less. Attorney General went on to say, I love this, trying to clarify ambiguity, went on to say, but that amount of time should increase with the relative importance of the decision being made. How's that for additional ambiguity for you? Got to increase is adequately. Yes, yes, got to increase adequately. Yes. So the Attorney General would be one place, right? But say you thought, you know what, I'm not going to bother asking the Attorney General. We're just going to put it out there as 12 hours. We're going to write up in our policy, we're going to notice meetings at 12 hours, and we're going to say that's how it works for us. Now, as a citizen and a member of the public, do you feel particularly say, say the county then turns around and, and decides to buy the old hospital for $3 million of public funds and they gave you 12 hours of notice. Are you going to feel that your constitutional rights were upheld at 12 hours of notice? No. So what are you going to do? File suit. You're going to tap into that other branch of government and you're going to file suit. You're going to say, look, I don't think that was adequate notice. For me, that clearly wasn't adequate notice, and I don't think anyone would define 12 hours as being adequate notice. So you could go through the court system and have the Montana Supreme Court give us a ruling on it through a, some sort of uh, case, uh, and they would say, yeah, like, well, in this case, they'd likely say 12 hours is, is not adequate. They may not answer what adequate is, but at least they'll tell you that's not adequate. So with the, with the AG, we got a more specific result of 48 hours. Yes, sir. So is the 48 hours, or I guess, when is the adequate time? Does it begin when the meeting is noticed or when the agenda for the meeting is posted? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? They seem synonymous to me. Posting the meeting agenda and noticing the meeting would be at the same time. In, that, in my mind, I say because... Uh, what is it that we're going to hear, discuss, and act on as a, as a board? That would be my notice of the meeting. Rather than just date, time, place for meeting, that's fine leading up to it, but then the 48 hours, the public should be noticed this is what we're going to be discussing, the decision we're making. So then they can decide, they have time to decide and respond, yeah, I want to participate because there's something in there that is important to me and I want to engage. But just saying we're going to meet on this date and time may not be sufficient. It's got to be... What is it we're going to be discussing? Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So again, two sentences in. Uh, the agenda of the meeting, as defined in 23202, must include an item allowing public comment on any public matter that is not on the agenda but is within your jurisdiction. So you need to allow, first, the first two sentences dealt with, you need to allow the public to comment prior to final action. So there's... When I said there's an ambiguity, not ambiguity, no, uh, there's flexibility. The legislature just says you need to make sure before you take final action, as the Constitution says, you've allowed the public to comment. Now, if you choose at the beginning of the meeting, stand up, do the question, and sit down, and you immediately can, you can say, let's see public comment. Here's your chance to comment on anything within our agenda. You can do that. You could say we're going to allow public comment with each agenda item. That's acceptable. You could have public comment on the agenda and not on the agenda at the very beginning of the meeting. Here's your chance to comment on anything, either on the agenda or not on the agenda. Or you could have public comment on the agenda at the beginning of the meeting and then public comment not on the agenda at the end of the meeting. Right? The, what I like about it is the legislature has not dictated to you how they want that set up. You can set that up how you want. It just has to have both of those. One, comment on agenda items before you make final action, and two, comment somewhere in that meeting of allowing the public to comment on something that's not on the agenda. That's, as long as you can check those two boxes somewhere on that agenda in that's appropriate manner, you have the flexibility to choose how you do that. And that's where you're going to develop your procedures, right? Thou shalt develop procedures for permitting and encouraging the public to participate before final action. So if you turn to page R, the right-hand pocket, R3. How many of you feel right now with your board you could find somewhere within your pile of stuff your board's rules of procedure that defines when and where we meet and how we're going to do our agenda and when we're going to do public comment? 
Can you put your hands on it? Good, good. What I have done, for those of you that are like, I don't know what he's talking about. What we have done is we have created for you, for your, for your help, a boilerplate rules of procedures. We just chose, in this case, the rules of procedures for governing water and sewer districts, right? On our website, now if you flip the packet over on our thing, www.msulocalgov.org, that's our website. And on there you can uh, find under resources, boards, there is this document as a Word document, not a PDF, it's a Word, so you can download this and you can modify this for your particular board. And you can take what you currently have with your bylaws or rules of procedure, whatever you want to call them, and take that and you can then uh, see in your current laws, bylaws or rules of procedure, what's missing. By reading this, it's, oh, we don't have this, let's add that. Or if you don't have anything, you can start with this as a boilerplate and you can just customize it for your own form. Does that make sense? Some of you may or may not have ordinance authority, right? So if you don't have ordinance authority, you can take that section out. Uh, water and sewer districts have ordinance authority, so that's why we have it in there. Or some of you might say, yeah, we're probably not going to ever have a hearing, a public hearing. Or, yeah, we're going to have a public hearing. Uh, so we're going to make sure that we're going to have procedures and expectations of how we're going to conduct that public hearing. What, what I find valuable, and this is a philosophy, right, the big picture, but we've also operationalized it this way, but what I find valuable is the more you can define for the public what it is they should expect from you, the easier it is to conduct business. If you haven't previously defined what they should expect, they're going to come to your meeting and engage you with their own expectations. And what's the likelihood that their expectations are going to match your expectations? Well, <laughs> right? Not. So it's easier for you to say, look, this is how we roll. This is our expectations. This is what you are to expect as the public when you engage us. And back to that issue between the internal and external. Here's how we're going to govern ourselves, board. This is our expectations of board members and how we're going to uh, uh, support each other and act with each other. You can set your own ground rules for board service and how we're going to conduct business as a board. What is the role and the purpose of the chair? What authorities are they going to have? Are they going to vote? Can they discuss a motion? Can they make a motion? Define all that up front. So you don't have just, well, I'm a new chair and I want to make a motion. Well, I don't think you can make a motion. Well, can you make a motion? You're going to have a big debate. And you're going to spend three months fighting over whether the chair can make a motion or not and not conduct the business of the people. Figure it all out. Write it down. Because this document, fortunately, is going to transcend any one of you. You all are going to come and go, right? What we want to left behind is some sort of governing document that's going to maintain consistency of operation that spans time and personalities. And if you don't have this, then your board has a potential to be whipsawed back and forth. And what happens when you're all over the board as a board, right? Can I say it that way? You're acting all crazy, you know, every other year you're doing something wild because you don't have any sort of anchor. How is the public going to perceive you in that situation? Is their trust in you and your competence going to be high or low? You can say it. I won't judge it. It's going to be low, right? There's not going to be a high level of trust between the public and your board because you can't manage a meeting out of a wet paper bag, right, without getting in a fight and having a big meltdown. It certainly is entertaining to watch. That's why we all like to watch Facebook Live with these meetings because, oh man, look at them go, right? They don't trust you to do a thing for them. And it's really sad that we've got a, our whole fire service, not to pick on firefighters, fire service, but our whole fire service is run by these yahoos, right? Something so critical as our, our family's health and safety and fire protection is left to these guys, right? Because you're behaving poorly or my water and sewer is being delivered to me by these guys, right? So if you think about trust, the higher the level of trust the public has in that governing agency, the lower the transaction cost of doing business. It's going to be easier for you to conduct your business when there's a higher level of trust. If you have a low level of trust, what do your meetings look like? Empty. 
No, it's either an empty because they've written you off, or what was your last board meeting or your disruptive? Disruptive. 120, <coughs> and I'm sure those 120 people that showed up at your budget hearing last year didn't sit there quietly listening to the debate. That makes good TV, doesn't it? <laughs> right? So, so high level shut. Shall I tell you? So you want to hear a story? Yeah. Remember about 10 years ago in the city of Bozeman, the Main Street blew up? Mm -hmm. Tragic yeah. accident happened, killed a young woman. Mm -hmm. uh, first responders in that community responded mm -hmm. gloriously. Emergency services, uh, fire, police, ambulance, disaster emergency services, all were stellar from a whole big region. The whole valley responded from Livingston to, to Manhattan and Three Forks. They were there to support and they did a grand job. What do you think the public trust was in those uh, emergency services agencies after that event? Uh, hi. hi. We saw you in action and you nailed it. We trust you. Those guys couldn't buy a meal in that town for months because someone was paying their check. You guys did such a great job. Your money's no good here or I'm paying for you or whatever. They loved it. Then about, that happened in, what was it, March? Then sometime in August, September, there was a young officer made some inappropriate comments on Facebook tied to his role as a, as a city police officer that were disparaging to the police department and to the public. One officer, poor choice on how he used social media, that blew up in the newspaper and it eroded all of that public trust in those emergency services agencies in a half a dozen posts online. That was August, September. Young man resigned. Tragic story in that regard. What was on the ballot in November? The city and county, in a joint effort, were trying to build a law and justice center for $75 million. It failed by a, a few percentage points. Had that vote happened eight weeks earlier, it would have likely passed. And as a result of that loss of trust, that we don't trust you, one officer eroded that whole thing to so that community, and now it is still a wild mess. The, the, the city and county could never get their act together again, so now the city chose to do it on their own, the county's trying to do it on their own. One, it's just been a mess ever since. And this was 10 years ago. This has been a 10-year fight. See, so it's really important when you think about public trust and how are we behaving as a board and are we fostering that public trust or is our actions and behavior eroding that public trust? And how do you manage that is by good policy and hold each other accountable for their behaviors and their actions relative to their interaction on that board. So hold the board members and say, hey, point of order, do we not have a set of ground rules for behavior by the board? And I don't think all of our ground rules are being uh, properly reflected. Can we review them together as a group? Right? Something like that to bring people in check. The other thing is what I find is if you have your ground rules for participation for the public and you line out for them what do you expect from them to be courteous, to you know, speak one at a time, you, know, you go through that list of just good meeting management. What I find is when people start being disruptive and you the public starts managing themselves from peer pressure. They might say, hey, Bob, number three. You're, you're breaking number three. Sit down, right? It's Bob, right? It is now. <laughs> right? So they'll start, they'll start putting peer pressure on each other and they start managing themselves. They say, that, you're, you're breaking the violating the rules. So think about that. Sometimes it's helpful to put those, those ground rules in the back of your agenda. Post them up. Well, you walk in the door of City Hall, and what's there in that big old framed picture? Ground rules, right? Still there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, read it. <laughs> <laughs> but, so call it out. These are our expectations. In order to water the tree of democracy, we expect you to behave a certain way. For us to do our duty, to provide you these services, we need to have a civil conversation about how we best do that. We appreciate passion. We get it. But you've got to have some sort of a parameters by which that passion is expressed. All right. Does that make sense? And it's the same within that, uh, within the internal, within the board. Have those ground rules for the board. This is what we expect, and hold each other accountable. If you don't have those ground rules, you're you're one election away or one appointment away from a disaster, where someone says, "I'm not going to live by those rules." Right? At least you have them written down and hold them accountable to it. You say, "Well, great. If you don't want to like, you don't like these rules, 
So let's change it, but we're going to have a debate, we're going to have a public process, and it's going to take a while to do that. Is that good? Oh, I'm probably hammering my microphone there. We good so far? We're, we might have been about three, three, three sentences in on our... All right. Okay, we're just going to wrap this one up here. Back to L1. However, the agency may not take action on any matter discussed unless specific notice of that matter is included on the agenda and the public comment has been allowed on that matter. Public comment received at a meeting must be incorporated into the official minutes of the meeting. Okay, so two more expectations that uh, if the public were in that part of the public comment of things not on the agenda, someone comes in and says, hey, I want X, Y, Z to happen, the board just can't look at each other and say, sounds good to me, those in favor of doing this thing say aye. Why would that be inconsistent with the law? The public has not been noticed that you're going to make that final action and not been given the opportunity to comment and to weigh in and help shape and frame what that motion would be. You just heard from one individual and you acted on their behalf. And you don't represent that one individual, you represent the whole entire jurisdiction, whatever that might be. So you need to allow, say, great, thank you for bringing that to our attention. I move that we place this on our next meeting agenda. You can do that because final action and final uh, comment can be taking place at that next meeting. So you can move to put that on a final, a future meeting agenda. You just can't make a decision on that meeting at that time. That's great. Well, on public participation, I heard a rumor, and it's just a rumor, but it brought up a question um, that a board wanted to um, either further limit or discourage <coughs> public participation. Is there a <coughs> Oh. <coughs> All right. So, <coughs> limiting the amount of the uh, public comment. Does anyone do that currently? The time, frame. the time frame. So you probably say we've got 15 minutes to take comment on this, and you try to manage it or something to that effect, Missoula. Or three, per, three minutes per person. Okay. So there we. Mm -hmm. So here's one of those things we have not yet received either an attorney general opinion on this or a Supreme Court. Moving on. So we don't know where the line is. But what's happened is city and county attorneys have got together and talked about this and say, well, what would be adequate? What would be sufficient so that we don't, uh, we're, we're not, could we, we're, we're allowing enough time to where we, people don't feel like their constitutional rights are being violated. Okay? And there's a bell curve there too. It seems like some people say, no, I want 45 minutes, and if you do anything different, then I will sue. Great, go for it. To your question, what they've decided is three minutes is a minimum. Nothing less than three minutes. So if you wanted to bake that into your rules of procedure saying that we will allow public comment three minutes per person, right? And it's got to be, you can't say, okay, we've, we've allowed you and you and you to talk for 10 minutes, but I don't like what you've got to say, so we're going to limit you to three minutes. It's got to be consistently applied across the board. Uh, and more would be better four or five minutes, and oftentimes people don't take the full, but some that do, you have a way in which you can pull them back and say, okay, just to let you know, three minutes um, is, is the time limit. If you're going to start applying at the meeting, you've got to apply it consistently across the meeting. So again, equality, right? This is one of those times where we're going to treat e people equally, not fairly, right? doesn't matter what you have to say, three minutes. I don't care if you're for or against the issue, three minutes. Um, so does that make sense? And, and then write it in your policy. <coughs> write in your policy <coughs> and give you some, uh, like what I call a release valve. Say in your policy that uh, with the majority vote of the commission or the board, we can uh, make it four minutes or five minutes. Not less, but more. Or we could suspend it all together. Say you just have one person showing up and you're so excited. Someone finally showed up at our meeting. <laughs> Take as much time as you want. Right? We're not going to limit it. So I move to suspend our rule you know, and so give yourself that ability to, to, to tweak that and just write that in. That we, you know, upon a, a, a majority vote of the board, we can extend or eliminate it altogether at that meeting. <coughs> Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So if you had <coughs> public comment on an issue, 
and that issue is table and then later you chose to vote on it would you have to have public comment again? I would I would I when they when you bring it back off the table either during that meeting or at a future meeting I'd, I'd bring it back up again and, and debate it and then take public comment again yeah I, yeah just to be safe what I'd hate to have is, is a good decision unraveled because we didn't do something like that. And the other question is, well, you know, why, unless you're playing games, right? You're, you're trying to clear the room of these malcontents and we're just going to table it and then randomly pull it up some other meeting. Uh, yeah, so, so then you start, yeah. So, so again, I try to be completely inclusive and, and transparent about those types of things. Other questions? <clears throat> you feel like I'm yelling at you? Yeah, I'm not doing my job then, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, sir. I got a question on the back of the Constitution. You mentioned the AG and the Supreme Court. Once the Constitution is written, the Supreme Court does not review it at all unless there's litigation concerning the aspect of it. Is that correct? Yeah, so what, what they're doing is this is, they're not reviewing this. What they're doing is reviewing this. It's how we're choosing to apply in our laws relative to that. And they're not going to just look at, oh, House Bill 17. Yeah, we don't think that's, that's right. They're agnostic about all that until there's a lawsuit that comes before them. And then they look at the facts of the case. They look at what the law says. And they'll make an interpretation. Is this consistent with the Constitution or is it not? So that's our recourse. Yeah. So that's... So if you... Uh, yeah. So this idea, we'll just quickly hit this, and I want uh, the Venn diagram in this context we're talking today. What would those circles? See how smart you are. What, how would I label these circles in the context of our discussion today? What's that? Branches of government. Branches of government. So what would they? So if we're to label, what are they going to be labeled as? Executive, legislative, and judicial. And you guys are fantastic. Like going way back to junior high civics class. <laughs> we have three branches of government, right? So the legislative branch, what is it they're responsible for? Corruption? Woo! It's a cynical bunch. That's the peanut influence. Here we go. So what is it they do? Laws. They create the laws. So in your case, you are a legislative group. As a board, you are legislators. You don't really have an executive branch. You just make policy or decisions on a legislative basis. Someone else is going to carry that out. So, right? so you're usually informing someone, or in the case of the weed district, the, the weed supervisor, or what is it, they call them supervisors, the weed coordinator. The weed coordinator would be considered an executive, loosely considered the executive. The board will meet, they'll deliberate about weed issues, they'll make a decision, and then it's responsibility of that weed coordinator to go out there and make sure that that happens. Does that make sense? So the weed coordinator or city council, where are you at? City council and the mayor. Right? So by and large, local government operates really seamlessly in this area right here. Do we have a judicial branch? It's outlined in the law, and I basically say, do what the law says, and you'll reduce conflict. Okay. On the local level, your local justice of peace is not deciding whether the, the policy adopted by the city or the county is consistent with the law. That's not their role. That's more of that uh, adjudicating uh, misdemeanors and those types of things in your community. Now, I bring this up about the, the legislative and executive branches because as a legislative body, your board, you have a board chairperson. They are not an executive. That's a whole different branch of government, a whole different set of responsibilities. Your board chair is a member of that board that you selected as a group to say, you're going to serve as the, as the chair. So what role or responsibilities are you going to provide, for, give to them in your policies and procedures or rules or procedures? They're going to be responsible for conducting the meeting. Think about how, how do you create the agenda? Who creates the agenda? As a, here's another question for you. As a board member, what power do you have as an individual board member? Just 
You have no power. You have no power as an individual board member. Zero. Your power comes when you get together as a quorum, at least a quorum in the governing body, and make a decision in a legally noticed meeting that has an agenda, blah, 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 blah. That's where your power comes from. So you separate that group in its, in, its constituent membership and you have no power. So, how do you call for a special meeting if you're not already convened as a special, in, a, in a meeting? So, in your rules and procedures, you need to define that executive authority and give it to the chair. The chair can call a special meeting. Because you can't say, well, three board members are going to get together and call a special meeting, because what is that? <coughs> it's a meeting, <laughs> right? <laughs> you, can't, you can't have a meeting, call a special meeting, right, without violating the law. So, so you, you need to find, and that's, in, if you look at the mayor and council, right, Council, unless you're in session, you can't call a special meeting as an individual council member. It's the executive function to call that. So what you're doing is what I'm proposing here is you're giving certain executive functions to your board chair. Developing the agenda, calling for special meetings. Very little outside of those two things you need to have someone do that you can't, individually, that you can't do collectively. Does that make sense? All right, so just think about those roles and responsibilities you're basically a legislative body, you're making policies and rules and, and providing some sort of guidance uh, or advice, recommendations to some other governing body. Oh, we're not anywhere near on our list here. What are we not covering? What have we covered? This? Meeting management. Do we talk enough about that? There might be more stuff I'll talk later. Good enough, I can cross it out. I've got enough consensus and head nods, I'll do that. Uh, yeah, not, uh, notice, 48 hours. And I would also recommend that in your, so like fire district, right? Here's what I would recommend, and I don't know if the clerk and recorder's office is going to like me saying this, is I would say, do whatever you do for noticing your meeting in your local jurisdiction. But I've worked it out with the county to make to, to have the county also post. If, if they're, I'm sure they're already doing this, I would imagine that you can notify them. Here's our agenda. And here's you know all of our notice, our meeting notice, and they can post it on those on the on the county's website. So that would be another way in which you're encouraging the public to participate. Right? There's multiple ways in which they can find out about the meeting. What it is you're going to talk about? Um, let's let's do this. Uh, there are six things, five, six, there's a few things, <laughs> I want to say six things that constitute a meeting, a public meeting, a legal public meeting. What are those six things that have to happen in order for it to be a legal public meeting? Notice. Okay, we need notice. So notice. What else? Public comment. Public comment. Agenda. We'll put agenda. Quorum. It could be, but I'm going to put it separate because yeah. roll call. Quorum. Quorum. What was another one? Roll yeah. call. Uh, that's not necessary, but it's something you probably do. Yeah. Minutes. Minutes. <coughs> All right, so now, I've got my numbers right. Turn the page, L3. L3. 23202. About the top third, call it says meeting defined. As using this part, this is going to come back to our electronic thing too, is, uh, using this part, meeting, quote unquote meeting, means the convening of a quorum, right? We got that one. Convening of a quorum of the constituent membership of a public agency or association described in 23203, whether by corporal or by means of electronic equipment. What do they mean when they say by corporal? In person. Whether in person or by means of electronic equipment. Uh-huh. Well, now that opens up a little bit of an of a opportunity for us, right? Okay. Uh, we'll finish this thing off here, and then we'll come back to that electronic equipment one. 
to hear, discuss, or act over any matter uh, uh, act on a matter over which the agency has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power. So here, discuss or act. Now, why did I make such a big deal about the or? Who's an English major in the room? Hear, discuss, or act. What would it would it mean different? It would have a different meaning if it said hear, discuss, and act. Yeah. So so what I like when I read a lot of these uh, Supreme Court case notes, they often the courts will say, if the legislature wanted to use and, they would have used and, or something to that effect, right? So they said no, they deliberately used or, or that's the word that they use. It's so what does it mean when we use the word or there? Any one of the three. You can hear something, or you can discuss something, or you can act on something. Any one of the three would constitute a meeting. So if you have a quorum that is either hearing, discussing, or acting, you're having a meeting. And in that case, you need to have notice, public comment, an agenda, and minutes taken. So if three of you that are on a board or sitting in the stands at the high school football game chit-chatting about hunting, and someone walks up to you and says, hey, I wanted to talk to you about the weeds over on such and such a whatever road. What just happened? Now you are hearing something within your jurisdiction and there is a quorum present. So you've got to figure out what are you going to do. I would think up ahead of time, if, there is a, if, if you're kind of a social group, you're bored and you like each other and you have a tendency to hang out together, well, you figure out a way to say, mm, not it, I'm going to go get popcorn and chew. You talk to this guy. I'm out of here. I'm going to remove the quorum from the room. It's better than saying, no, 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 no. We're not talking about this here. Go away. Right? Public loves it when you say that. Like, Go away. I don't want to hear your... But you say, look, we don't want to have a public meeting here by discussing this, so I'm going to go and remove myself so it's just going to be two of you. Now you're just two citizens talking to a third citizen about a public issue. You're not a quorum, a governing body. Does that make sense? Go ahead, sir. Quorum is, is not defined as three people necessarily. It's, it's defined in your bylaws or your rules of order. It's defined in the law by saying it's majority of the board, the, the, the numbers, right? So it's a great question because I'm assuming in that scenario that there's five-member board, okay. right? So that would be three. But if you have a seven-member board, what would be a quorum? Four, right? So you just do the math. It's got to be a majority of it, of that the constituent members. Now here's another one I'll throw out there. What if you have a five member board and two people resign? What's the size of the quorum? Two. Say it louder with pride. Two. two. Right? Why two? Four. Yeah, because there's three left. There, you can't be held accountable for people that don't exist. Now what if you have a five member board and two are in vacation? No. Three is, is, your, is your quorum, but if you were to pass something, what's the vote got to be? Three, if it's going to be, if, if your bylaws say that it, something to pass has to have a majority of the body. Does that make sense? So the majority of the body is going to be three versus if there's two people that are not, they're vacant, they don't exist, we can't be held accountable for people that don't exist, so in that case, two of the three would, would work. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't want to confuse you, but, but just think about that. If, if they don't exist, then, it, then you're, the dynamics shift. But if they're on vacation, right? So now, huh? by electronic equipment, they're on vacation. They're in Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> and it's February, right? And you're a little annoyed at that. So you need to have a meeting, a court meeting. They want to be in, engaged. They say, tell you what, we will Skype in or we will call in. Right? What I would suggest in your rules of procedure, wherever they are, that you write in a policy about what constitutes an electronic meeting. Will you allow it at all? Right? The, the law allows you, if you choose, to have an electronic meeting. That's something you can do. My argument is that the, the sword cuts both ways. There's a great uh, Supreme Court case note on this. Uh, there's two county commissioners that met over the phone and discussed the land use issue and decided how they were going to vote. 
And then they had the meeting and they voted. So, now this is the interesting thing. How did we find out that they had this conversation over the phone and decided how to vote if one of them hadn't said, we met last night on the phone and this is how we decided to vote. So, yeah, that happened. So <laughs> they were sued uh, because they said, look, at quorum of you were discussing using electronic means. Electronic, and that constituted a meeting that then required these other things to happen. So the sword cuts both ways. Since those things didn't happen, you were having an illegal meeting. A meet, well, I like to say a meeting inconsistent with the law. But if you did these things, then could you have a meeting consistent with the law? Mm -hmm. There are many state agencies, public, public service, public, public service commission, they, they meet a lot over the phone. The Fish and Parks uh, Commission meets sometimes over the phone. Uh, now, what I would recommend is that you define when are we going to meet over the phone, what constitutes, a, you know, we're going to allow that to happen, right? Try to figure that out ahead of time, right in your policy. We have some jurisdictions say we will not allow that at all. You either here or we don't have a meeting, right? Some will say, yes, you can join, but here's the deal. What if you just join just for that agenda item? We don't have a quorum, but you call in for the five-minute discussion around that agenda item, and then you get off the phone. What's going on there? No quorum. Now we have a quorum. Now we have no quorum. So I would write in your meeting <coughs> your policy that if we're going to have someone join us by Skype, they're going to join us at the beginning of the meeting, they're going to participate through the entire meeting, and they're going to disengage at the end of the meeting. You could require, we're not going to do things over the phone, it's got to be by Skype. I want to see the whites of your eyes. I want to make sure it's you on the other end. I want to see you be accountable to what's going on with all of us, and body language is an important part of that. Right? So you can define what those expectations are, to the point of all five, five of us could be gone, and we can all join by Skype. We'll just have our clerk or administrator open the meet, you know, have the meeting facility open, we'll put a bunch of five laptops up, and we'll have the public engage, we'll conduct it as if we were sitting there. Yes, sir? So if it's over the phone, how does the public hear? So, yeah, so what you'll do, let's see if I can do this, I'm smart enough to take another drink. Uh, what they'll often do, like in, in your case, say the airport board, you just have the same meeting at the same time in the same location, allow the public to come and participate, but that person might join in uh, have a, on a speaker phone, conference call phone, or does that make sense? And so you might have four members, and the, and the fifth one is over the is on the phone. Right, but if you had three a three member board, two of them are on the phone. They've noticed that they're going to be on the phone. They have to provide a speaker phone for the public to engage. Just at the meeting <coughs> facility. Just at the meeting yeah. facility. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't have like a call in wherever they can call in from wherever and sit in there house and do it. Yeah. So this would be like any other meeting. The expectation would still you come. A table with a speaker phone on it that anybody can in theory, you could have, yeah, you could have five laptops with everybody's fancy face on it and all participate in it. We've got a jurisdiction up on the High Line that they couldn't find anybody in town to say yes to serving on the, on the city council. Two years they went vacant. And finally they had a guy who said, yeah, I'd love to. You know, he was being sarcastic. But I go to Arizona for six months out of the year. And they said, ooh, <laughs> not a problem. They bought him a laptop, <laughs> and they gave him permission to be out of town for, for six months. And so he goes down, and so for six meetings of the, of the year, he joins in by Skype. And so they, you know, they just say, well, you know, the meeting starts, and here's, here's Bob. You know, they kind of show him around everybody in the room. Here's everybody in the room, and he sits down just where his normal seat is. And he's got a laptop there uh, in Arizona. He's participating in the meeting there. And so it's just like he was there. Now, if it's, if all of them were gone, you could, in theory, have water on you, six laptops or five laptops there, and you have the clerk taking notes or whatever else. You say, yeah, welcome, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. You decide. Again, flexibility. That's what the law says. The law says that you can have, well, by electronic means. So you decide whether that's going to work for you or not, and under what conditions is it going to work. There's a lot of options, but I, what I would encourage you to do is write it down. Have as a policy so it's so it's consistent, it can be applied across the board, and it will transcend any one of you. It'll be there when you're gone. And they can always change it in the future if they don't like it. This applies to the subcommittee? 
Okay, thank you for bringing that up, because often we'll ask. So, we don't want to talk about this issue at our public meeting, because, you know, the public's going to be kind of a hassle, and, uh, so we're going we're gonna to workshop this in a subcommittee. We're going to create a subcommittee, and they're going to go off and they're going to talk about this issue. I think there's a very, oh, there's an interesting, I think it's a Supreme Court case here in Missoula about closing down schools. And they're having meetings of this subgroup of a group, right? So when, it's, when it says in the law, with the Constitution, maybe that's an easier, I can find that easier. Look back at the Constitution, number one there, or nine, or eight. Public has the right to expect governmental agencies to, is that the right one? Okay. I don't know. N uh, number L1, it's uh, number nine, the right to know. No person shall be deprived of the right to examine documents or to observe the deliberations of all public bodies or agencies of state government and its subdivisions. Right? And that's a theme that also plays out in the law. So a subdivision of government, state, county, municipal. Now, if you make a, uh, an ad hoc board, boards are a subdivision of county government. And your board makes a committee to deliberate on some specific issue. That committee is a public body that also is required to notice its meetings, create an agenda, uh, have, known, uh, uh, have minutes, allow public comment. So you're really not getting around the public participation because even the subdivisions of the government have an expectation to comply with the open meetings law. Does that make sense? So, yeah, I'll, say, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. So make sure that if you're doing that, if you're creating those, those subcommittees, that they too are also noticing their meetings and, and participating in it. The other thing I want to just blow this section up right here. The agenda. Okay. Agenda. This is what I like. I'm going to pick on our fire friends here. This is the thing I love on, on a, a, a fire district's agenda. It'll say, agenda item number three, fire truck. Agenda item number three, fire truck. Now you, as a citizen and as a member of that district, do you feel adequately noticed <laughs> that on the agenda of the fire district it says fire truck? I would probably say no, because what do you mean fire truck? What about the fire? Are we buying tires for the fire truck? Are we fixing the engine on the fire truck? Are we buying a new fire truck? Are we painting the fire truck? What about the fire truck is it that you're going to be hearing, discussing, and deciding over? I don't feel adequately noticed to decide whether I want to participate in, or in this or not. If it's to replace the tires, I may not care. If it's to buy a new fire truck for $230,000, I care, right? And when it says adequate notice of things that are of significant interest to the public, right? The constitutional expectation that you allow the, con the, the public to participate on issues of significant interest to the public. Do you think the purchase of a fire truck is of significant interest to the public? Mm -hmm. And do you feel like the public is now adequately noticed when you just put fire truck on there? <laughs> you get my point? So my recommendation, and for all boards, my recommendation. I just—it's easy. It's easy to use fire truck because you can say the purchase of 19 or you know 2004 international two and a half ton comfort truck for ninety thousand dollars, right? That if that was written out on your agenda, then the public says, okay, I know what they're planning to do, and I can decide whether I feel like I want to engage and participate in this dialogue about how we're going to invest. $90,000 of the district's funds for fire protection, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, so if you have fire truck and all those great things I just said, right, the purchase of a 19, the 2004 blah, 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 blah. You're expecting a lot of public to show up and you're anticipating a room full of people because they're interested in concern. They want to know, is this the best decision for this, the, the, the department? Is this our seventh fire truck that we bought? In, in a year, you know, I, they, they want to know what's going on, why are we making this decision. Here's what I would recommend when you have and anticipate these more uh, engaged 
meetings where people are showing up and they want to participate. How do you manage that meeting, manage expectations? So what I would suggest you have on your, the way you, you structure this is you have the notice on your agenda and then you have written down or somehow you say, we're going to do some sort of an informational presentation. Fire chief is going to say, you fire, fire, right? I'm going to keep pointing to you. And you yeah. the fire guy. Sure. Sure? So if you're the fire chief, he's going to give a presentation. We are buying a new fire truck because we need to replace the 1963 whatever, whatever that hasn't worked in two years and it's frozen and it's all the pipes are broke, blah, 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 right? It's a mess and we don't have any adequate protection right now. We've been saving up diligently for the last eight years to have enough money to buy something that's going to fit, you know. And so the, and this is the process we went through. We bid out, we got all these up, uh, you know, bids in and these are the six different ones we have to choose from. And I'm choosing, I'm recommending the purchase of this one for these reasons, right? Now, if the public is all wound up because they heard on, or read on social media, read on Facebook, that they're buying a ladder truck and it's a brand new shiny thing and it's painted pink and, you know, and all this great stuff on it, you know, they're going to come up, you know, loaded for bear. They're all upset and they're angry. That informational presentation is going to help cool the room down. Right? If their expectation is that you're doing something crazy, and they just realize, oh, well, that sounds very reasonable. So you give that informational presentation, help them see how reasonable you are. Then you do a question and answer session where the board is asking questions of the expert. You can say the same thing with planning, right? You have some sort of presentation by staff. The planning board would ask questions, what about this and that? So you have this question and answer. And if you're a smart board, if you're smart, you're thinking, what are the concerns of the public? And can I anticipate what those questions are and ask them? Even if he gave the answer here in his presentation, I'm going to ask it again so that the people can hear it a second time or a third time and get comfortable that, yes, we're consistent with how we're operating. Then you'd allow public comment. Now that the public knows what the issues are, the questions have been answered, you can allow them to ask questions or to, to comment. Now they might get up and ask 50 questions. That's up to them. This is the time for them to comment prior to final action. So you don't have to respond to questions unless you choose to. That's entirely up to you. Right? But at least you need to hear what they have to say. And what you're looking for is help us shape the decision making process here. And you may hear something in that discussion that you might, ooh. We hadn't thought of that. That is something we had not considered. That's a whole new way, a diverse way of looking at this particular issue that we didn't anticipate. Maybe we want to table this and have the chief look into this a little bit more or whatever. Right? You could be responsive because really what we're interested in is making good decisions. And if you're not so dogmatic about we're the smartest people in the room right? and, and we're going to make good decisions on your behalf, just trust us. Don't bother coming. Right? That's not how the system is designed. So you say, look, we really want to make a good decision. This is the best we're doing. Can you help us make sure you're okay with this? What other ideas are we missing? Right? So you allow that public comment to take place. Then you make your motion. Uh, motion, I don't know how that spells. Anyway, so you make your motion. The point here is that the public has a chance to weigh in. And if you write out your agenda item in a way that kind of is descriptive about what your intention is, then they know the direction you're headed from the agenda item to purchase the blah, 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 blah for hundred whatever thousand dollars. So now the motion, right, is framed based on what their comments are. It might deviate from this, which is fine. It shows that you're being responsive to the comments that you're receiving from the public. Um, make the motion, then you debate, and then you take action. Now I'm going to Drawing a line here. Why am I drawing a line between the public comment and the motion? What's significant about that transition? No more. What? No more public comment. Yeah, we're we're done with the. So this represents here the public input process, and this represents the deliberative process, right? So here we want to get all that we can to make a good decision. And now we say, okay, we've, we've done all we can, we've done all of our homework, now it's time for us as a board to take all that, 
process it, come up with a motion, debate it, and take action. That's the point of us in this representative government, that you've chosen us to represent your interests and needs. If you do this, this former part here well, then they're going to hopefully trust you to make good decisions here. And if you try to circumvent some of this stuff here, the whole process is flawed. Right? The outcome is legitimate. As coaching of that as a board member is that when you have a motion, you have public comment on the motion. Is that just... That, so again, is that, is that comes back to the beauty of this process is they have not dictated... One and a half dozen of yeah. Me, for me, philosophically, I like this as a cleaner. Now, because... The reason why I say that is because they're informed here as to what our intent is. Does that make sense? I would be less supportive of allowing, so I'm not keen of having, here's our motion, now take comment, because if I hear something from that comment, I've got to go through a whole series of amendments to change it, right, to reflect that, that new in, input or insight. Um, if this is well articulated here, then when they make their comment based on the direction we're going and, and where we think we're headed with our motion, then this can be relevant. If this is vague, and then they make their public comment, and then your motion is a little bit squonky from what they expected, they're going to be upset. Because you zigged when we thought you were zagging. I want another bite of the apple down here now that I know what the motion is, because it's, I thought you were going this direction, but that direction, because you're unclear in your communication. Does that make sense? So they're going to want to comment after the motion. They're going to beg, let us comment again because now you're going a whole different direction we didn't expect. So the more transparent, the more you can tee that up and say, this is what we expect to do. We're anticipating adopting this. We want to buy a fire truck. Now let's talk about it. That, you know where we're headed. This is why we're headed that way. We've justified our actions. We've given you the reason why, you know, all the options we had. This is what we feel is the best thing to do. Comment on that. It may say, look, can you, can you spread the payments out over 10 years instead of five years? Well, let's consider that, right? Or whatever. Or we don't need it for these reasons. Bob's got a truck. He's got a tank on the back. He dumps out his pesticides. He could be a firefighter. Right? So that's their solution. Well, that's not sufficient. <laughs> Thanks, Bob, for your offer, but it's not sufficient. Anyway, that, does that help? Uh, I guess I have a question. So long as you have public comment in there somewhere. Before, by the As long as it's before here. Okay. That's a must. My preference is here. You can decide and just write it down in your rules of procedure. Okay. Where are you gonna, where you're going to have that break? Some again, you can have public comment on every agenda item. Here's another thing: you might have a whole room full of people. They're there for one item, one agenda item. They're all there. And so what you could say is, when at the beginning, you say we're going to take public comment on anything on the agenda, right? Except we would encourage you if you want to talk, talk about agenda item number three. We're going to give specific time for you then to talk about it. So if you're here to talk about agenda item number three, cool your heels. We'll get to it. But if there's anything else on the agenda that you want to talk about, here's your chance. Right? Because you want to have that opportunity to set the stage for them. So they're not up here talking at the beginning of the meeting about the pink fire truck that's a ladder truck and all these other things that's like completely inaccurate. And they're all wound up and frothing at the mouth over things that they are ignorant about because they haven't had a chance to get the, the right information. So you say, just hold that thought. We're going to get to that here. So if there's anything, you want to talk about claims, you want to talk about the, the turnout suits that we're buying, whatever, let's talk about that now. Does that make sense? Okay. Have we done anything else on our list? Where is my list? Mr. Clark. Yes, sir. Comment. What happens if we've got a fire district in the county and a, are advocating to increase their budget to put on a, uh, per se, a new truck, per se, but they don't, they talk about the board meeting, but it's not really publicized. What they do is they send it into the county, that goes in there as an increase in a mill levy, because that's how they procure their equipment is through a mill levy. So we have no input on what they're doing other than we see it on an increase in the mill levy. We have no vote on that. We have no say on it. But if the mill levy's there, we're paying it on our taxes. How can they get away with that? 
And yet, we're impervious to that because it's there, but we have no control over it. So part of it, unfortunately, will come back to accountability, right? So if, if they, if indeed in your scenario, if they didn't notice it, they didn't go through the proper process of noticing and allowing this public discussion, and they circumvented that, circumvented the law and the Constitution, then you have standing to say, hey, look, my constitutional rights were violated. So make sure that you research and make sure that they hadn't had meetings that were properly noticed and publicized on this. But it wasn't publicly. A lot of people didn't even know they were voting. Yeah, and it, and, it, and it seems to me, and I could be wrong, but it seems to me in order for them to increase the mill levy, they just can't ask for it, and it just happens. They have to go to the voters to, to get an increase in the mills. I could be wrong. I don't see a budget guru in the room, but. You see it on the tax rolls because it's a mill increase. And so. It, so sometimes there's an increase in your tax rolls, not so much because they increased, uh, well, it, but there's other other reasons why your taxes might go up besides. Yeah. It's new equipment. Yeah. So. Replacing aging equipment. Yeah. So it should they should go through the proper process, and if they hadn't done that, then you then, that. then you could, you could hire an attorney. <laughs> or ask for minutes. Yeah, ask for minutes. So I'd research it first to make sure. Too. Yeah. Uh, board minutes that are a month old, you never see them until they come up to approve board minutes. Yeah. So where are they publicized at? Here's the thing to remember, and I already forgot it. Something you said, <laughs> and I forgot it. That's <laughs> <laughs> from a month ago or something. Uh, well, uh, don't remember it now. All right. Um, moving on. Moving on. <laughs> All right, I don't have time to sit here and deliberate over my poor memory. Go ahead. Before you get too far off, can I just one specific question about the meeting in general? Yeah. Uh, so the meeting spreadsheet or the flip chart. You have a regularly scheduled meeting. Everything is in order. It's been noticed. Everything in the quorum doesn't show up. You have no action items on the agenda, <coughs> nothing that requires a quorum for voting. Can you still hold a meeting and it's public, it's been noticed, can you still hold a meeting and discuss issues without any actions? So if there's not a quorum, then what, it, what you have is a, a collection of citizens that are talking about a public issue. Yeah. So what I, would, what I would suggest in that situation, so if it's a, so say it's a nine member board and, and so four people show up. Right, which would not be a quorum. Four people show up, it's like, well, let, maybe we can just talk about some of these things. So there's, there's something what I would, if you want to do that, that's fine, but I would take notes, not many minutes, take notes and then share that with the, those members that aren't there, but it's still got to come back onto a, uh, an agenda. But at least if you're, if you're working, grinding through a particular issue and clarifying it, then somehow you want to make that get back to the original board members so you don't necessarily have to plow that ground again, but then come back and, and continue the conversation. Sometimes people say, yep, we're, we're just walking away. We're not going to do this. But part of it, the, there's many reasons. Both, I think, would be okay, but I would, because, you know, I would just say, take notes of what's going on. They're not meeting minutes, but take notes. Sure. So it's, it's still okay as long as you're not having any action. No action, no, nothing official is going on there. It's just a collection of citizens now. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yes, sir. So, on the advocacy thing, I should have said advocacy versus conflict of interest. Yes. Okay. I was pulling up this other. So, so in the Montana Code of Ethics, and on L9, it starts on L9. So, you are a public body representing the public. So there is a particular role that you have to play uh, that's not going to create a conflict of interest or violate this, this trust the public has in you to do work on their behalf. I'll point you to, uh, L, let's see, L10, 2-3, or 2-2-103, public trust, public duty. And, and this kind of frames out the, the code of ethics. The whole of the public office or employment is a public trust 
created by the confidence that the, the electorate reposes in the integrity of public officers, public employees. A public officer, public employee shall carry out the individual's duties for the benefit of the people of the state. So there's an implied relationship between the public and you as a, as a public official, right? By virtue of serving on a board, you're a public official. And there's implied in that relationship that there's trust, that we trust you to make decisions on our behalf for the benefit of the people of the state, right? So when I ask you to serve on a board, I want you to deliberate on these things, but I don't necessarily need you as the board member advocating for something on my behalf, trying to tell me how to vote. So I want to just differentiate between the, the difference between advocating and educating. You can educate me and help me understand what the issue is and what's the consequence of a vote one way or the other. But, I don't, but we don't want you to advocate for vote for XYZ motion. This all stems back way back with school boards, bless their hearts. And so what the school district was asking the school district members to increase their taxes, to do some capital improvement. And so what they did is they had little slips of paper that said vote for bond levy, blah, 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 and they pinned it to the back little kids' backpacks as they got on the bus. <laughs> they were advocating. They're using public resources to advocate for uh, some sort of a, uh, a political or a, a decision for the public. And, and the public saying, no, that's not what we asked you to do. We asked you to make decisions and present to us options, but not advocate for it. So it was the vote for which created a lot of problems. So just think about, on, our, on your behalf, you're like Switzerland on some of these issues. If you want to go before the public and ask for a, additional taxes, a mill levy increase, to provide a particular service, you can educate them and say, this is what we plan to do with this increase so we're going to increase your, your for a home of $100,000 value, it's going to go up by $7, $7 a year. And with that $7 a year, it's going to generate X amount of thousands of dollars. And with that thousands of dollars, this is what we plan to do with it. We're going to build this, buy that, create this. That's educating them. And for a $200,000 valued home, taxable valued home, this is what it's going to cost. You're educating them. You're not saying, now vote for us because this is what we really, really need. Now we're advocating I don't know if that helps you with your question. So there's a narrow definition on the yes. bottom of L9 of what constitutes a private interest. <laughs> it has mostly to do with ownership or some sort of affected by your business or some financial gain. Yep. If you were on the board of a non Get a good feeling because hey, these things, this thing I yep. really believe in is being helped by the decisions made by this government yep. board. Is that a conflict of interest? Strictly in that scenario, no, because there's not a, a pecuniary interest. I'm not getting enriched by. So if that board is providing a public service, providing a public good, that nonprofit board is providing a public good. For example, this we could be talking about Great Falls right now. There is a uh, a city council member whose wife serves on a nonprofit board, and that board had historically been providing a public good, a public service for the community, and the city has historically been pro uh, providing grant funds or funds to that board to provide that service. And that was brought up that said, hey, hey, well, wait a minute now, you're a council member voting on something that's going to your wife's board that she serves on. But there was no pecuniary interest. There's no enrichment. She's not getting enriched by it. To provide a public service, it's just going through. So there, that wasn't going to create a. Normally, the conflict of interest follows money. Yeah. So there is a. So if you look down here around uh, two dash two dash one twenty one on L twelve, there's a list of things thou shalt not do: use public time, resources, and equipment, supplies for your own personal business interests. Um, engage in substantial financial transactions with people that you supervise. 
perform an official act directly or substantially affecting the economic benefit of a business or other undertaking in which the officer employee either a substantial financial interest or engaged in counselor consulting or a representative of right so I can't be engaged in so it could be if you looked at maybe consulting a representative of or an agent of so you'd have to have legal counsel look at what's the nature of my relationship with this nonprofit board what's the decision being made by the public board and is there a pecuniary interest that's involved there and it, so it's, it could be a case by case in this situation no and another situation might be yes but is the drawing line it could have a pecuniary interest to the organization as a whole the nonprofit, but not to you right then you're clean yeah I'm not benefiting by this I don't get enriched by this I'm not using insider trading or, or insider dealing to enrich myself we're, we're, we're taking these public resources to provide a public good yeah now if I was a staff member on that board and I was going to get a bonus because of it or something right that could be create a lot of problems yeah all right okay that's fine um, <laughs> Is there a place that we can check that? Because I would see that I would think that there is a conflict of interest in it. Yeah, legal counsel. Yeah. So, so here's the deal. I would strongly encourage. If you call me, I can say, well, this is what the law says. But if you need interpretation, talk to legal counsel, because all of this stuff really depends upon the facts of the case. What's what am I doing? What's the nature of my relationship with whatever I'm dealing with? You know, and it's it's all case by case. Here's a note. Oh, got another good story you want to hear a story we may not get everything on my list but we'll, there's a there's a there was a county commissioner who is who has a, a financial relationship with two other guys in the ownership of a plane right they own they jointly own a plane well actually there's five of them that own the plane two of these guys also own property next to the airport and they are coming to the commission to ask for a change in the zoning of that parcel of land to make it uh, so they can put a fixed base operation for helicopters and landing pad and some other things. Now the commissioner saw it, ding 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 red red flags big bells. I don't know if I'm going to have a conflict of interest because I have a financial relationship with these guys, but it is completely separate from what they're doing over here. I have no business relationship with this, but I have a business relationship with them here, and I know enough that this looks funny. So he immediately went to the, to the county attorney and said, help me understand what my role should be as we go through this process where I have to make a decision about this land use uh, rezoning. I need to decide on that, but I also have a financial relationship with these guys separate from that. So they went through and studied out the relationship and the business and the money and the flow and all that stuff, and it was determined that there was no conflict of interest. However, strongly encourage that that commissioner, when it comes time, discloses the fact that I am in a business relationship. This is the nature of that relationship. But I can be impartial. In spite of my relationship, I can be impartial in the way I deliberate over this particular issue. So he's declaring for the public, I have a conflict, or I have a, the nature, I have a relationship with these folks, but it is not conflicting with my ability to carry out the duty of my responsibility. So he's disclosing the nature of that relationship. So a lot of it's just disclosing. So if, he, if the commissioner did have a conflict of interest and recused himself, how does that affect the forum for voting? Does that uh, so look on the bottom of L13, thir disclosure. A public officer or public employee shall, prior to acting on a manner that may impinge on the public duty, right, may create a conflict of interest including the award of a permit contract or license, disclose the nature of the private interest that creates the conflict. The public officer or public employee shall make the disclosure in writing to the Commission of Political Practices, listing the amount of private interest, if any, purpose and duration of the person's services rendered, if any, and the compensation received for the services or other information that is necessary to describe the interest. If the public officer or public employee then performs the official act, then acts after having disclosed uh, the officer employee shall state for the record the fact that the summary nature of the interest is disclosed at the time of performing the act. So they may not even have to recuse themselves. <laughs> they just have to 
disclose the fact that I have a relationship here. I'm going to make a million dollars on this decision. <laughs> <laughs> so, there is an out. And there are some times where they have to make the decision. And it's really awkward for everyone. And oftentimes, it's better just to recuse themselves and say, I'm out. Then, if it's the commissioners, the other two have to decide. And the only way that's going to pass, they have to be unanimous. Can't be a one-to-one. -one. So if it's five, you'd have to have a, a three to pass that. If one you recuse, it wouldn't change the nature of the... the so it's not like somebody resigned. Correct. Yeah. So on a county commission, you'd still have to have agreement between the other two commissioners for it to pass. Anything here we can do quickly? Minutes. Minutes. Uh, back to L4 or something? Seven. Oh, yeah, there's seven too. And so there is a narrative there on, on I think L7 probably talks about m minutes, how to write them. Uh, Bottom of L3, minutes of meetings, public inspection. Appropriate minutes of all meetings required by 23203 must be open to the public and must be available for inspection by the public. So here's the other deal, folks. You're at a meeting, you finish the meeting, and you have, and you're the minute taker, and you've got a bunch of raw notes that you've taken for that meeting that will eventually become the official minutes. And the member of the press comes up and says, Can I have a copy of those meeting minutes or notes or whatever they call it? What do you do? You make copies of them, you write all over it, notes, draft, uh, unofficial minutes, and you give it to them. Those are working papers of the public body. Boing. <laughs> so, they're not official minutes, but they're working papers. So, they're still a public document, it's a record of the local government, and it's, it's something that's open for uh, request. But they haven't been approved. Correct. The they have not been approved, that's why they're notes, they're not minutes. Uh, and then so so press deals with it at their own peril now minutes must be included without limitation date time place of the meeting a list of individuals present uh, who are in attendance the substance of all things proposed discussed and decided where am I at here here discuss act proposed discussed and decided so it's it's or the decided. substance of those things what's that or decided, or decided. Yeah, so it's the substance. It's it's uh, that doesn't need necessarily to be verbatim, but action items, right? Motion, vote, motion, vote, motion, vote would be insufficient. You need to have enough context there for the future generations that may need access to those minutes to give them an idea of what was the logic, what was the substance of the decision-making process that resulted in this, whatever. So the substance of what was proposed, decided, and acted on or discussed. Uh, the other thing that you need to do is boards, county boards, where am I at here? County boards need to, within 30 days of adoption of those meeting minutes, need to turn them into the clerk and recorder by statute. That was added in 2017, I want to say, or 2015? I think it's 2015. Now here's the deal. Historically what had happened is, say the airport board in a small rural airport, uh, they had some gal that was taking meeting minutes for 30 years. And in her basement was boxes and boxes of meeting minutes and official records of the airport board. She passes away. Her family shows up. Well, this crap mom working on that airport board for all this. Let's just take all this stuff and throw it away. So 30 years of history public records that are supposed to be stored for perpetuity are now sitting in a dumpster somewhere in a dump because we had no way to back it up. So the, the legislature is saying, look, we need to have somebody have access to these public records for perpetuity. So they've asked that you turn your records in, your, your minutes into the clerk and recorder who is the election or who is the records administrator, quote unquote, for the county. And then they can archive those on your behalf. All the other records that you need to retain on your own, but those meeting minutes, they want to have one single clearinghouse. So if, as a citizen, I don't have to go to six different jurisdictions to try to track down minutes. I can go to the courthouse and I can find all the minutes for all the meetings that at least were approved within the last 30 days. Does that make sense? All right, so we got a couple things crossed off here. Advocacy, minutes, agenda, is that good? Social media, 
Facebook Live and those types of things. Uh, I, if you want to go that route now, if, to, 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 to differentiate here, if the public comes in and wants to, to record in Facebook Live your meeting, can you prevent them from doing that? No. Unless they're being disruptive. They're putting it right up in your face, yeah, you can kick them out for that. But if they want to set up a deal like this, that's, that's, they have the right to do that. And the, the law has now changed. They don't even talk about the media. It's anyone that wants to come in and record your media. They've really expanded that. Because the question was for a while there, well, who's media? Who's, you know, I, are they got to be credentialed? And there's a whole big discussion. They said, screw it, we're just going to be... Anyone that wants to record your meeting, either they don't, even have to, they don't even have to notify you that they're recording it. Why is that? We're in a public space, doing a public meeting, conducting public business. So there's no expectation of privacy. All right, so so they can record. Now, that's up to them, right? We've had some jurisdictions where then the public takes that video and then they doctor it and then they post it on YouTube, right, or Facebook or whatever. And now you don't have any control about what's going on, right? And now they're shaping the narrative. So what some jurisdictions are doing now is they're saying, we're going to Facebook Live it, but then we've got to make sure we have a way to archive it. So records, I don't have any good solution for you, but that's now a public record that's created by the public body that has to be retained. So talk with your records retention specialist for the county and figure or the city and figure out how do we retain those Facebook Live videos. Can we talk the draft? Pardon? Can we talk the draft? There is a records retention schedule out there that that uh, I don't know about the draft off the top of my head. Minutes are for perpetuity. Some of those working papers are as a timeline for it. Uh, recording, if you audio tape, do an electronic recording of your meeting as an aid to making the official minutes, that audio recording needs to be held for two years before it can be destroyed. That's new also. So if you go to the Secretary's web, Secretary of State's website, you just type in, in their Google search, uh, Schedule 8, Records Schedule 8, and there will be for the local government schedule of how long to retain some of those records. So make sure that if you're holding records, that the retention schedule has been expired, get rid of them. Uh, if you hold them for too long, then they come, you have to send them to the historical society. They have to determine whether it's a historical document or not. Or if you're getting sued, it's like, oh, crud. We should have got rid of these records. The retention schedule said a year ago we could have destroyed them. Now it's evidence B, <laughs> right? And you can't throw them away then. Now they're locked in, you, you have to maintain them. So sometimes if you don't purge your records when you should, it can become a liability for you, as many cities have found out. All right. I apologize we didn't get through everything, but we got through many things. Notice most of it. Thanks so much for your service. Appreciate it. This whole thing would not work. Oh, that's what I was going to say now. I remember. Jeez. Anyway, thanks for your service. Appreciate what you do. The whole system wouldn't work if it weren't for your volunteer service on these public works. So good luck and we'll see you in six months.